Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 3 John, 3 John chapter 1 <laughs> and verse number 9. Let's stand together. 3 John verse 9. Let's all stand together uh, for the Scripture reading tonight. And uh, what a beautiful song we just heard. Thank the Lord for it. <clears throat> 3 John. And as we're turning there, I want to remind you of just a couple of things. Don't forget to stop by the resource table and uh, pick up the remaining tracks and stickers. Uh, we ran out of the yard signs this morning, and uh, I, I didn't realize we didn't have as many as I thought, so they went quickly. Thank you for picking those up. Mine is in my yard, and I want to encourage you to pick up some of the gospel tracks. Uh, we serve a risen Savior, and there's no better time to witness than the resurrection season. And just, uh, just take every opportunity. Uh, I, I found uh, yesterday, I had to get a haircut yesterday afternoon and had the opportunity to give several people invitations, and everyone was friendly and receptive. And I just believe this is the best time of year to get that message out. So stop by those resource tables. also want to remind you that the point is not open tonight after the service, so please make a note of that. Our soul winning and outreach this week is Thursday morning at 9. 30, Thursday evening at 6, and then, of course, on Saturday, a big day as well. So make a note of those items, if you would, please. 3 John, verse 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither Doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church? Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Let us pray. Father, as we continue our study of 3 John, I pray that you would fill us tonight with understanding and illumination. I pray that we would learn from this negative story of Diotrephes how not to live the Christian life and that we would be a people on guard in our own spirit and even with our associations of this type of an attitude. And Lord, bless the song we'll hear and then the message tonight we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In 3 John, in verse 4, the apostle John writing to the church pastored by Gaius, says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And what a great joy to see your children following in the ways of the Lord. There's no greater joy for a parent. There's no greater joy for a pastor. There's no greater burden than when a child or a church member strays away from the truth. And yet, for the most part, in this short epistle, John the Apostle is commending the children of faith. He is commending the fact that they had been hospitable to traveling missionaries. And he mentions in verse 5 the strangers that had come through and uh, were treated with hospitality. And we find that in many cases, the references to traveling missionaries or soul winners and fellow workers of the Lord. And there was a health and there was a hospitality revel, uh, uh, present in the, uh, in the assembly. But we also find that there was a problem. And the problem is really surrounding a particular individual by the name of Diotrephes. Let's say that name together. Diotrephes. You'll not find many children named Diotrephes. I've never met one in my entire life. Because the name Diotrephes is synonymous with pride, dissension, contention among the believers. And we find that Diotrephes was a man that had created problems so difficult in the assembly that the apostle now addresses him by name. By the way, loving spiritual leadership is willing to mention sin issues that disturb the local assembly. It is the duty of the apostle or even the pastor to notice and to address such issues and incidents that would hinder the fellowship of the local New Testament church. And the problem of this particular individual 
was a problem of control, a problem of divisiveness, and a problem of wanting dominance in the church. Now, we might summarize the problem of Diotrephes with one word, and that is the word pride. He was a man with a great pride. And what I want you to notice tonight in our preaching time is that there were three negative effects of this pride upon the assembly. And these are effects that none of us should ever want to bring into our family or into our church family for that matter. Now I want you to notice first of all tonight that pride hinders the work of God. Pride hinders the work of God. Now if you would notice in verse 9, John the Apostle writing, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Pride always hinders the spirit of progress in the people of God. And we see regarding the pride of Diotrephes that he desired dominance. The Bible says of this man, he loveth to have the preeminence. Diotrephes, his name means nourished by Jove. Jove, the name of a supreme deity amongst the Romans, uh, mentioned here or alluded to here, is the planet Jupiter or the air or atmosphere. Jove and Diotrephes was nourished by this spirit. His name fits his ego. Perhaps he thought of himself as a god or as someone of the uh, aristocratic, elevated uh, personage that would be able to bring his opinion to bear in the church. Uh, Jerry Vines wrote of this particular uh, person, Diotrephes, the name occurs everywhere in secular Greek literature. It is identified with Greek aristocracy, even nobility. Evidently, this man was upper class among the elite when he came to the Lord. He was accustomed to being in the spotlight. He was trying to run the church. Now, the world will often elevate such a man and even be in awe of someone with this type of pedigree. But in the church, the ground is level at the cross. And we are taught that we are not to be a respecter of persons. I love the Lancaster Baptist Church for many reasons. I love the fact that people in this church have been redeemed from every walk of life, from every educational station and from every uh, cultural background. I believe this church to be a miniature of what we'll see in heaven with so many different kinds of people and all of us worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and all of us kneeling before the Lord Jesus Christ. For with God, there is no respecter of persons. There is no such thing as a caste system in Christianity we are all equal in the eyes of God. There is only one way to be saved. No matter who you are tonight, there is one way, and that way is Jesus Christ. Amen. But Diotrephes saw himself to be something a little bit different. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.17, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Romans 2.11, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And so we see that God is no respecter of persons, but this man, Diotrephes, desired dominance and respect in the congregation. He was a man with a haughty spirit, a proudful spirit. And the Bible is clear about this in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Now let me say tonight that pride is at the root of every sin we ever commit. Let me say that there's not a person here that does not struggle with pride. You might see someone that is quiet and sullenly in their spirit, and yet that can be sometimes a manifestation of pride. Sometimes it's someone that is loud and boisterous and opinionated and showing their pride in that way. But all of us would be wise to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when He convicts us of something we say that is wrong or brash or judgmental or something we say that is divisive uh, in the family or in the flock. Anything that we would say or do that hinders the work of God, every one of us should be ready and willing to confess our sin of pride to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because pride goeth before destruction. Now think about this matter of pride, if you would, for a moment. One of the first glimpses that we get of the sin of pride is with an angel by the name of Lucifer. 
And the Bible tells us that this angelic being desired also to have prominence, desired exaltation. Turning your Bible, if you would, to Isaiah 14 and verse 12, and let us see the devastating effects of pride as it related to this one, Lucifer. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. To, be to, to desire, to be exalted, is the same attitude that Satan had with this haughty and devilish spirit. He said, I want to exalt to the place of God. And this is exactly what Satan said to Adam and Eve when he tempted them in the garden, that they would be like gods if they would partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, it was the temptation to be like gods that caused them to stumble. I would say to you tonight, that many times in our lives we want to take the place of God. We would never say it that way. But we want to make decisions without seeking His face. We want to make decisions based upon what we want. And oftentimes we can get ahead of God. And what is that when we get ahead of God? It is pride. It is showing that we are not properly humbling ourselves before Him. Donald Gray Barnhouse said of this passage, he therefore proclaimed that he would set up an independent rule, speaking of Satan, whereupon a multitude of angelic beings of heaven decided to follow his rule and join him in his rebellion against God. Let me tell you something I've learned over the years. No one backslides alone. You show me a man that gets all up in pride and says, no one's going to treat me like that. I don't deserve that kind of thing. Why? Who does he think he is saying that to me? And he stomps his little body out of the church. And guess what? He hurts his wife and his children in the process. No one backslides alone. Oh, that we would come to the place of humbling ourselves and realizing it's not about us and it's not about being noticed and it's not about receiving accolades that the Christian life is all about bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Diotrephes didn't live that way. The Bible says he loved to have the preeminence. He had a haughty spirit. He had a presumptuous spirit. Pride is often the root of many other sins. James 4 and 6, we've quoted this morning, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Here is a man who desired a dominance. Notice that in verse number 9. Who loveth to have the preeminence. Let's say that together. Who loveth to have the preeminence. Now let's be honest. Every one of us appreciate perhaps being noticed or someone seeing what we've done and yet there's a subtle trap in that because when we don't receive what we believe we should have received then depression will come listen depression is often a reverse form of pride and I believe in Christian counseling and thank God for those in this church who minister in that area and I believe sometimes there's perhaps need for even medical help but I'm going to tell you tonight in all honesty that much of the depression in this world is a reverse form of pride. It is the result of thinking of oneself over and over again. Why did this happen to me? Why didn't I get the attention? Why didn't I get what I deserve? I deserve better than this. God doesn't know what he's doing in my life. And Diotrephes was one who loveth to have the preeminence. He desired dominance, but notice secondly, not only a desired dominance, but secondly, a divisive control. Now this is amazing. And with those that have this pride problem, there comes with it a desire to control every situation. Notice in verse 9, it says, Who loveth to have the preeminence among them, and he receiveth us not. Let's say that together. Receiveth us not. Now, in Proverbs 13.10, the Bible says, Only by pride cometh contention. In fact, Proverbs 22.10 says, Cast out the scorner and the contention shall go out. So here we see a contentious man. 
And we'll look at this in more detail in just a moment, but I want you to understand the context. It is John, the human author, the Holy Spirit is the author of this book. But John is telling us here in verse number 9 that this man, Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, receiveth us not. That is to say that he was not receiving. He was rejecting the apostle John. An eyewitness of the resurrected Christ, an author of Scripture, humanly speaking, ordained of God as an apostle, but Diotrephes thought so highly of himself, he would not even accept the fellowship of John. Sometimes I can wonder as a pastor, I wonder why that young preacher made such a big decision and never even bothered to call. I wonder why someone in the church would make such a life-impacting decision and, and not receive the counsel of a pastor or even seek it. And I may have a musing like that from time to time, but then I'm mindful of situations like this. And I'm mindful of the fact that there are some Christians, listen to me, that if John the Apostle was standing in this pulpit and you were facing a major decision in your life, you may not even seek his counsel because your mind is made up, because you are in the driver's seat of your life, because you already know what you're doing. Why would you consult with an apostle? Because you are you. This is the amazing thing about pride is that we can get to the place, listen, where we hinder our own spiritual development because we don't think we need to receive the word of even, in this case, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, let us always stay humble and easily entreated. Let us always be the kind of believers that seek out the word of God and seek out godly counsel and let us never be the kind that receive it not as with Diotrephes because his pride was hindering his own spiritual growth. Pride hinders. Notice secondly tonight, pride hardens. Pride will always harden a Christian's heart. You remember in the Old Testament the admonition so oftentimes, harden not your heart as in the day of the provocation. Constantly the Jews were being reminded, don't Harden your heart. Now notice what the, the apostle says in verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. How many of you know you don't want the apostle keeping track of your bad deeds? That, that part of the, of, the, of the verse is amazing to me. John said, I'm going to remember this. John is noting the fact, and by the way, there is such a thing as apostolic authority in this era. John is noting the fact, in the era of the first century, John is noting the fact here that this man, Diotrephes, is causing damage in the church. He is noting the fact that Diotrephes' spirit is keeping the people from receiving blessings, and John the Apostle saying, I'm keeping note of that. I will address this if I come your way, because his pride is hardening his own heart, and it is hindering the work of God. Now, notice how pride had hardened uh, Diotrephes. First of all, we see that he had spoken malicious words. He had spoken malicious words. Notice the indications of a hard heart. It says in verse 10, prating against us with malicious words. Now, this is an interesting word, prating. Uh, fluoreo. It means this, to utter nonsense to talk idly, to accuse falsely with malicious words. Someone that is lifted up, someone that is rejecting godly counsel, in order to maintain control of their situation and the influence that they want, will do anything to keep that pedestal, even if it means tearing others down. Diotrephes was employing a method where he was speaking malicious words, listen, against the apostle John, who ultimately died a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ, whose uh, garment, Diotrephes, was not worthy to touch the hem of his garment. But, as is often the case, especially in the era of internet and Facebook today, 
Some guy who lives in his mother's basement can sit there eating his Cheerios, giving his opinion about great men and women of God. And Diotrephes was a prating fool. Can you imagine this man's heart was so hard, was so bad that he would slander the Apostle John? That he would speak maliciously against one who had lived a godly life for many years, who would die a terrible death for his love for Jesus Christ. Proverbs 10, 18 says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. And yet Diotrephes, with all of his pride, was playing the fool. What Diotrephes was saying about John was sheer nonsense. But there are people who love to hear nonsense. And one of the lessons tonight for us besides not becoming a Diotrephes, is to not empower the Diotrephes by listening to their nonsense. A mature believer, when they hear someone belittling and besmirching a faithful servant of God, ought to have enough courage to say, that's enough. If you want to talk about brother so-and-so, let's go to him right now in the Bible way. We're not talking about calling out a false teacher. There's nothing wrong with calling the name of someone that is an apostate or someone that is speaking against the truth. John was neither. John was a faithful, God-fearing apostle, and he was being spoken against. And I'm saying to you tonight, not only must we be warned to avoid the sickness of soul that had come to Diotrephes, but we must also be warned that when someone is praying maliciously in this way, that we're not interested in that that we'll turn away from that. He was prating. Notice it says, he was prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren. He's prating against the authority that God had placed in his life. Like a rebellious teenager who said, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Here, this Diotrephes was rebelling against John. You remember the story of such rebellion in the Old Testament. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 16. Let me give you an illustration of this type of rebellion of heart. In Numbers 16, we read the story of Korah. We find that God does not take lightly this kind of speaking and prating evil against faithful servants of the Lord. Numbers 16 and verse 1. Now Korah the son of Izhar, the son of Koath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, and the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pila, and the sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing All the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Here we see Korah gathering men with him and accusing Moses of lifting himself up above the Lord, lifting himself up above the congregation of the Lord, accusing God's men, accusing Moses of wrongdoing and accusing Moses of not leading in the way that he should. Verse Numbers chapter 16, if you would turn ahead to Numbers 16 now in verse 31. It says, and it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under him, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. You're saying, Pastor Chapel, are you saying that someone who gossips against a man of God or someone who maligns someone's character, that the ground is going to open up and that God is going to bury them alive? I'm not saying that's God's way of dealing with these things in the New Testament era, but I'm telling you from the testimony of Korah, we learn that God is not pleased when someone maligns his servant. And when it comes to these matters, it takes two parties, one to speak and one to listen. And oh, that we would be warned tonight not to be the speaker, but also not to be the listener to such things. 
Diotrephes spoke malicious words. Diotrephes was never content. He was never happy in the sense of his position, accepting his position. He always wanted something more. Notice what the Bible says here in verse 10 once again. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Now, I don't understand the full nature of Diotrephes' pride, but there's something about pride that wants a little more, a little more, a little more influence, a little more room. And, and this man, Diotrephes, he would, he would say these wicked things, but it was as if he could not say enough. He wanted to say more. He was not content with what he had been able to do. The Bible speaks about contentment in Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Listen, someone that is not content with God is going to find themselves frustrated and inwardly struggling and constantly fighting and constantly involved in controversy because they are not content with God Himself. When you are content with God Himself and someone else is being elevated, someone else is being used, someone else is being blessed, you will have the ability to say, praise God for His blessing on their life. Praise God for using that man of God or that woman of God. And you are so content with God and God alone that none of these other things will bother you so greatly. A part of the root of Diotrephes problems then was discontentment. He was not satisfied with what God had done, with what God was, with who God was in his life. Philippians 4 and verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 1 Timothy 6, 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Here we see Diotrephes. He spoke malicious words. We see Diotrephes. He was, he was not content uh, with what God had done in his life. Notice thirdly, Diotrephes rejected the brethren. Now we saw this once. Notice again in verse 10. It says, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. This man, Diotrephes, would not receive, that is to say, he would not admit. He was not happy when he heard John was coming. He did not want the apostle to come. He apparently rejected other brethren as well because they were going to cut in on his turf. Over the years, I've, for various reasons, at various times, gone to perhaps a teacher or someone involved in leadership and said, you know, I'd like to have so-and-so, they're a guest coming in this week to teach your class. By the way, the philosophy here is this. God called me to be the pastor in 1986. Twelve people asked me to be their pastor. Since then, we have started roughly 100 classes. Every teacher that teaches a class teaches in the stead of the pastor. I can't be in all the classes, but these are men and women of God that we know and love and believe to be sound doctrinally, and they're standing there on my behalf, and I'm glad that they are. And they're wonderful teachers. But every one of them should be willing, if, if pastor was able, to say, pastor, come teach the class for us this week. Or if pastor felt that Missionary Jones from Uruguay might be a blessing to the, his design class that pastor would recommend that he come and that he would be welcomed by that teacher to teach the, his design class. Everybody following me here tonight? Amen. Not in recent years, but I've had a few times when someone was suggested I'd like someone to teach the class, and there's a bristling. There's a fine line between ownership and being very responsible and a protectiveness that is born of pride. How many of you are tracking with me tonight? Diotrephes crossed that line. Diotrephes was not just having a loving protectiveness for the flock. Diotrephes was finding ego gratification from the flock. And when John wanted to butt in, he said, Hey, we don't want you here. Even if you are an apostle, we don't want you around here. And sometimes he cast people out because of his desire for the preeminence. He would not receive them. 
Now, this being uh, in the emphatic uh, present tense, this phrase would imply that he was strongly rejecting them. He was letting it be known. You are not welcome here. That's a little bit of the opposite of the song we used to sing. Brother Hopkins, we haven't sung this yet. I mentioned it the other night. There's a welcome here. There's a welcome here. There's a Christian welcome here. Did you find the words of that yet, brother? I know you have it somewhere. We found it once, maybe. We did. We sang it that one time. And that's the spirit of the New Testament Baptist Church. There's a welcome here. There's a welcome here. There's a Christian welcome here. I'm not singing it right, but you get the idea. <laughs> The Atrophies rewrote the song, you're not welcome here, you're not welcome here. This is my turf, you stay out. Why? Because he loved to have the preeminence. In fact, notice in verse 10 also, it says, and he forbiddeth them that would, and he casteth them out of the church. The word forbiddeth means that he hindered them, he prevented them, he was hindering them from ministering, from proclaiming, and, and his jealousy would not allow him to be a team player. He saw every new person that had a gift as a threat, every new person that could sing or teach or exhibit some type of ministry uh, uh, was someone that would perhaps rob him uh, from his opportunity, and Diotrephes was hindering the work of God because he was hardening his heart toward the work of the Holy Spirit on behalf of that church. So pride hinders. Pride hardens. Thirdly, pride hurts. Pride will hurt the church. Pride will hurt the family. Now, tonight as we come to verse 11, notice the loving admonition of John the Apostle. Notice it in verse 11. The first word is what? Beloved. Say it with me. Beloved. One more time. Beloved. Beloved. Diotrephes loved that he was loved. John loved because God loved when, when John said, Beloved, there was a God-given love in his heart for these believers. Beloved, follow not that which is evil. You mean he's calling Diotrephes evil? Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. John is going to identify someone who would refuse others of his servants into the house of God as being evil, as polluting and hindering and hardening and hurting the work of God. And he says, brethren, uh, I want to encourage you to stay away from that which is evil and to cleave to that which is good. So many times today Christians want to just hang around the evil to get enough of the gossip. You get filthy, dirty around you. you got to go home and take a shower just to get the malicious, praying gossip off of you. And John is making no mistake about identifying what Diotrephes was doing. He's identifying it as evil and as hindering to the work of God. And I want to say tonight, friend, I don't want to have anything to do with hindering the work of God. Pride can pull people into evil and hurts. And the spirit and direction of a church can be hurt. So John speaks to them here. He says, Beloved, the first admonition is this. Reject the evil man. As John had mentioned, he said, I may come. I may come and see you. The situation's getting worse. Perhaps Diotrephes uh, will we'll not want me to come, but I want to challenge you in the meantime. Follow not. And, and this is an interesting word as well. It is the word mimiomai, which speaks of imitating. He's telling them, don't act like this. Don't follow this diatrophies. Until I get there, don't let the poison spread. Don't let this attitude of malicious prating, gossiping, getting on the internet and talking about things or listening to things, don't, don't let that poison grow in your life. Don't follow this. You say, well, who does John think he is? He knew who he was. He was a God-called servant and apostle of Jesus Christ doing his job. And a part of the apostle's job was to say, Reject the evil 
man. Flee ungodliness. Follow after righteousness. Let not your good be evil spoken of. Here we see a warning from the apostle. Reject the evil man. But notice, secondly, follow after good men. Verse number 11. He says, I want you to follow that which is good. Now try to get the heart of the apostle. He's saying, I hope to get there and see you. How many of you can think of times when the apostle Paul said something similar in his epistles? John is saying, I'm hoping to get there. But until then, remember this. Until then, here's your prescription. Flee the evil man. Follow the good men. Pretty basic, isn't it? Folks, most of you have been saved long enough to know who's evil and who's good. Somebody that will spew out against God's servants is probably not somebody you need to be hanging with. Nearness is likeness. College students, listen to me. You'll have some of this. You'll have somebody that gets on some website or somebody that's been around some gossip and they'll try to say something. There, there are certain things, I'll just be honest with you. You want to you wanna say, you want to spew out about Brother Getz? I'll just tell you, you're on fighting ground right here with me. So that's kind of fleshly. I'm just, maybe it is. I'm just telling you. I'm going to follow good men. You don't want to say something unkind or cruel or sensitive or wicked or sinful about Dr. Don Sisk around me. No, no, no. You better, you better hold off right there. Say, well, I've got the goods. You better have two or three witnesses. And until you do, you better shut your mouth. So are you the kind of preacher that's just going to cover something that's true? No, I'm glad to discover a matter, and that's, that's uh, certainly uh, the case that happens from time to time. But I'm going to just tell you here, there's too much loose talking in the society in which we live. And, and this is what uh, uh, John is saying. He said, look, at, I, I don't know if I'll get there right away, but until I do, here's a little counsel for you. Uh, run away from evil and follow that which is good. That'll work for the third grader tonight. That'll work for the freshman in Bible college. Loose lips sink ships. You be careful of someone that has nothing but bad to say about God's men. Oh, I'll tell you, I've heard my fair share of stories, and I've sadly seen some men that one time were good men who fell by the wayside. But even when that happens, we should not rejoice in that. Even when that happens, we don't need to spread it all around. Listen, the devil does a good enough job with that. He does not need your help. Reject the evil man, John says. And then again in verse 11. But he says, I want you to follow after that which is good. Follow not that which is evil, but follow that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. Why? Listen. They never build a monument to a critic. You watch for a man. I think of Dr. Lee Robertson tonight. 40 plus years in one church, 60,000 baptized, faithful to his wife, faithful soul winner. He preached here many times. I think of Dr. Sisk, who I've mentioned. I think of Brother Martin, 45 years in the Philippines. I think of these men, and they do good. He that doeth good is of God. They don't do good for a week or a day or a decade. They do good over the course of their lifetime. It's probably a pretty good bet that you can learn something from them. Follow them. Say, well, I don't follow no man. I'm glad you said that because that, that's where I was going with this message. We don't believe in a man-centered identity. Our identity is found in Jesus Christ. We understand that. Our motivation is Jesus Christ. We serve because he loved us. We understand that. I'm thankful for your appreciation and encouragement to me in the ministry over these many years, but I've done my best to point you to Christ. I want you to be a people that are faithful, fervent followers of Jesus Christ. But I've got to tell you that in the New Testament pattern, God uses men to point other men to Jesus Christ. And I've had some rebellious type people over the years tell me, I don't follow men. Ain't no man going to tell me how to live my life. I remember going out to Edwards Air Force Base years ago, and I had two visits. One was with the base commander, and one was with an E-4 in the Air Force. My first stop was with the E-4. My next stop was with Colonel Rhodes. 
I went to the E4's house and I thanked him for visiting our church the week before. I spoke to him about salvation. He claimed he was saved. I spoke to him about baptism. He was a young married man. I said to him, I want to admonish you and encourage you as a young married man that the next step in your Christian life is to identify with Jesus Christ and his church in baptism. And I went on further to explain to him that baptism is a picture of identification with the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that baptism is also symbolic of death to the old life and resurrection to the new life. And as he sat there drinking his beer, and as he sat there listening to his Led Zeppelin records, I was doing my best to explain to him that if he was truly saved, then the noble thing and the biblical thing and the right thing to do would be to turn away from that and identify with Jesus and get all in for Jesus Christ. And I spoke that to him in love and with fervency, as I challenged a young man to set his path for Christ. After 30 or so minutes, he said to me, he said, well, thanks for coming out here to the base, but ain't no man gonna tell me how I'm gonna live my life. I prayed for him, left his house. I went to the base commander's house. I spoke to him and I thanked him for visiting. Dr. Curtis Hudson had preached for us a few days before. I found out that he and his wife had been saved. I proceeded to share with them what is the next step. I shared with them exactly what I shared with the E4. That the next step would be to identify with Jesus Christ. And that baptism means you're identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And that baptism means that you're dead to the old life, raised up to new life in Jesus Christ. And that I, by identifying with the Lord in baptism, you are setting direction that you will follow Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. That next Sunday morning, in our old building downtown, Colonel John Rhodes uh, walked down the aisle, shook my hand, and said, my wife and I are here today to present ourselves for believer's baptism. We want to identify with Christ and with this church like you told us yesterday in our home. And isn't it amazing that a young man who hadn't accomplished much more than washing the driveway in the United States Air Force, maybe polishing a tire on an F-16, wasn't going to let any man tell him what to do. But someone in authority, someone that was truly saved, someone that understood the Word of God, was more than willing to let another man tell him what God would have him to do. Amen. I find that men in authority sometimes understand how to respond better to spiritual authority than other men do. Now think of the phrase, ain't no man going to tell me what to do. And I want to just close with a few scriptures for you. If you would look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. We're going to look at several very quickly. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. All right? Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Back in July of 1986, I stood in this pulpit. It's been remodeled, but this wood piece here and down through here is the same exact wood. I've, I've borne through and burrowed through a couple layers on the top. But the same, the same piece of wood, is, it's been re revisited and cleaned up. And I stood behind this wood, and I said to the church, I'm a young pastor, but as long as I'm faithful to my wife and faithful to the Word of God, I would like to ask you to encourage me and help me and follow my leadership. And that's what I said. And I believe that to be biblical in its request. As I follow Christ, as I follow Christ, Paul said, turn to 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 4, verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I also sent Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul says again, be ye followers of me. Philippians 3, if you'd like to turn there, Philippians 3, 17. Philippians 3.17, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Turn there if you would. Philippians 3.17. You say, well, it must have just been because 
Paul was an apostle. No, notice in Philippians 3.17, brethren, be followers together of me, he was the apostle, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. By the way, that is exactly why I thank God uh, for the connection group leaders of our church, the Sunday school teachers, because they are men and women of God who are giving an example, who are worthy of a testimony. They're an example. They're worthy of followership. And how many of you are thankful tonight that there are many men and women of God in this church to whom a young child can look and understand a little bit more about the Christian life? This is God's pattern. 1 Thessalonians, turn there if you would, chapter 1 and verse 6. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. You became followers of us and of the Lord. Now again, someone said, I ain't following no man, I'm just following Jesus. Okay, that's wonderful. But you never heard about Jesus unless some man told you. That's how it works. God uses human instrumentality. And the tragedy of Diotrephes was that he was hindering the church from hearing men like John who could help them to know Jesus more. Amen. With Diotrephes, it was all about Diotrephes, but with John, it was all about Jesus. And because of his pride, he was hindering the work and he was hardening his heart and he was hurting the work. Oh, tonight, the Bible is clear about this Diotrephes sin. Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Pride hinders the work of God. Pride hardens the heart of the servant of God. Pride hurts the work of God. And I want to ask you tonight, is your spirit hurting or helping others? Your spirit should be the spirit that says, oh, listen, Missionary conference is coming. We've got a great man of God coming from Africa. We're going to get to hear from a great missionary preacher. Listen, you've got to hear this. It's going to be a blessing. I remember the night Dr. Tom Malone preached in this church. Great man of God. One of the great voices of fundamentalism in the past. A highly educated man. A tremendous preacher of the great church in Pontiac, Michigan. Midwestern Baptist College, a, a wonderful servant of the Lord, at one time pastored the largest church in this nation. I, I told our church of three or four hundred, Dr. Malone's coming. They didn't know who Dr. Malone is. They just knew the pastor was excited and that I had told him he was a great man of God. Nobody knew Dr. Tom Malone at Lancaster Baptist Church. But thank God this church has always had an open heart to Bible preaching. Dr. Malone came and he preached the Word of God and he preached about the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you ought to get the old tape from the archives somewhere. He preached that night about uh, praying and uh, going out soul winning with a lady and he, before he could talk to her, he, he was, she was telling him how her refrigerator stopped working. He said, I wanted that lady to get saved. He said, I've never done this before but I put my arms around that refrigerator and I began to pray. And he had an old gravelly voice like an old prophet of God. He said, I prayed, oh God, heal this refrigerator. He preached like that. And he had his arm, and he said, after a while, the refrigerator went, it started making noises. It started to shake. It started to work just a little bit. And he, he said he prayed and healed that refrigerator. And he said, tell that to Oral Roberts. I'll never forget that night. That was, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> he was just having fun on that part of the message. It was a wonderful night. I'll never forget right before church, he said to me, Paul, my wife wants me to get home fast as I can. He says, Mama wants me to get home to Detroit. He said, I checked. There's a red-eye flight out of L.A. He said, I, I need you to get me to L.A. by 8 o'clock. This is before church. The, he, he's telling me this at 5 to 6. He said, when Mama speaks, I got to listen. I said, I understand that, but there's laws of gravity in nature and <laughs> police between here and there. But how many of you know when Tom alone speaks, I listen. I'm not going to argue with a man who can heal refrigerators. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so many of our people wanted their Bible signed. I had a huge box of probably 200 Bibles. Got in the back seat. He signed Bibles. He preached. That service ended at 7. We went out the side door. I'm going to confess my sin publicly. I had him to the airport at 8.02. <laughs> By the grace of God. I was not in j jail that night, thank the Lord. I got Dr. Malone to mama by the next morning in time. Oh, our church was excited.
I think of the days of Dr. Curtis Hudson. I think of the night when he preached on revival in this church family for more than an hour, kept coming and kept coming and praying at the altar, receiving the men of God. I'm so grateful for a church that has wanted to hear the preaching. And, and, and I, I don't believe there's one here tonight that would have the spirit of Diotrephes. But may, may it never be so. May we always say, bring it, bring it, bring the preaching of the word of God. We want to hear what God's word says. Don't let your spirit hurt the church. May I ask you this second question? Is there someone in your life that's affecting your spirit right now? Is there some just little curious pop-up and little remarks and comments you get here and there about the Word of God or preaching or church? Maybe some little snide remark like, how long was it tonight? You ought to get back to him and say, real long and real good. Amen. Is there someone that just has that little cutting remark about the Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God, the old-fashioned way. I mean, just someone's got to always have their little comment in. Is there somebody like that that would like to affect your spirit? Hey, why don't you go ahead and do what the Apostle John said and don't follow that which is evil, but follow that which is good. You see, tonight we ought to say, by the grace of God, I want to always receive the Word of God. I want to receive the teaching that comes that is biblical and right and that I need. And for those that would question and for those that would try to castigate, for those that would be sarcastic, for those that would somehow cut down this matter of teaching and preaching the Word of God, I want none of that. I don't want it to affect my spirit. I want my spirit to be right toward the preaching of the Word of God, toward the preachers of the Word of God. Diotrephes, he loved to have the preeminence. He had a hard heart. He hindered the work of God. He hurt the work of God. John, he just wanted to help his beloved. He just wanted that beloved church to hear from God and to know the blessedness of fellowship with God. Flee that which is evil. Follow after that which is good. It's not that difficult if we'll just let the Holy Spirit lead us along the way.